that is without sin cast the first stone. Anyone got a stone they want to cast? Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, I pray that you will hide me so securely behind the cross that it is your words and not mine that are heard, O oh Lord. I pray that you will open our eyes that we can see, our ears that we can hear, our mind that we can conceive, and our heart that we can hold and believe and live out your words that are spoken this day. In Jesus' name, amen. The story of Jesus Christ as it comes to life in his followers is a story of freedom, uh, to be sure. But it's a freedom constrained by the cross, and it is deeply at odds with the individual notions of liberty. In the story of the woman caught in adultery found in John chapter 8, we find that Jesus freed her. He did not condemn her, but he did admonish her to go and sin no more. Jesus spoke to her being freed from her sin, but was holding her to a better way of life. You know, we did just celebrate uh, our National Independence Day this past week. It was a date chosen to remember our liberation from tyranny of taxation without representation. It is the day we shook off the enslavement of being ruled by an English kin. What is freedom exactly? We just celebrated our national freedom. What, what, what is freedom to you and to us? Well, I looked it up in Merriam-Webster, my favorite, and it's defined as follows. Freedom is the quality or state of being free, such as, first, the absence of necessity, coercion, or constraint in choice or action. Second, it is the liberation from slavery or restraint from the power of another. You see, the first definition addresses our freedom as a body as a person, while the second addresses our physical state of being. Have you ever been in debt to someone or something? Anybody out there totally, totally free, free of debt? debt? All right, you get, get down, down with your good selves. I'm so proud of you. But, but have you ever lived, lived under, under the terrible anxiety of not knowing how you were going to pay a debt? Ah, uh -huh. yes. yes. If you've ever been in debt, you know the impact it has on a person. No one wants to be burdened by either kind of debt, whether it's the debt of uh, being uh, coerced and controlled by a power outside of ourselves, or whether it is a liberation from a slavery or restraint from the power of another, such as the evil one. No, no one wants, wants to be burdened by that. By that. Yeah, Yet every one of us sitting in this room, every one of us, even the two that are deaf, all of y'all back there, we do all owe a debt that we can never pay off. But I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I want to talk to you a little bit more about the woman caught in adultery. You see, she was caught under a Hebrew law, a moral debt. Whereas our forefathers and mothers were suffering under the yoke of indebtedness to an English king thousands of miles away. But what about us 21st century Christians today? We are not subject to the Hebrew law, but we are subject to the laws of our nation. We are not bowed down by the yoke of the tyranny of a king many miles from our shore. However, comma, we, we are, are subject to the laws of the land, and, and as Christians, Christians we, are we are subject to the rule of God. And, and in this relationship, we, you and I, owe a debt that we can never repay. The Hebrews did have it right 
when they had an understanding that all people are sinners and in need of redemption. You see, the ancient Greek word for sin means to miss the mark. It actually describes an archer's arrow. And I did not know this, but I learned this just preparing for this sermon, that to make the mark means you hit the bullseye. Anything, Anything on either side of it, I don't care how close you come, is missing, is missing the, mark. the mark. I thought, I thought that, that was really interesting. interesting. You see, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter whether your arrow is close, close to the mark or far from, from it. it. If you, you didn't get the center, center, you lost. And, and sin in life is the same as an arrow in archery. If, if you, you miss the, the mark, mark, you lose. lose. But let's go back to the story of the woman caught in adultery. Jesus did something unique here, as he did not condemn her, but he did admonish her to do what? Absolutely. Go and sin no more. He forgave her sin, but he called her to a life of righteousness. Since this occurred prior to his death and resurrection, this woman was still going to be held accountable to the Hebraic religious laws, wasn't she? However, things were about to change, weren't they? It was this act of Jesus, as well as many others, that I believe Paul was meditating on when he penned his letter to the Galatians. It is entitled, in many Bibles, Christ has set us free. Galatians 5, 1 reads, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit to the yoke of slavery. Our text today is Galatians 5, 13 to 26, and it is here that Paul is addressing the Hebrew law. It's an issue that's being pushed um, onto Gentile believers by the Judaizers. The Judaizers were a group of Christians, but they were Jewish Christians, and they felt that you not only had to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you also had to adhere to the 621 religious laws of the Jews. And so these Judaizers were telling the pagan, as it were, converts, the Gentile converts, that they had to be circumcised, that they had to follow the Hebraic Jewish law. They seem to lack a complete understanding that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and not by our own efforts or works. The Judaizers believed that to be a Christ follower, you still had to adhere to the law, to the law, to the law. In this instance, they were referring particularly to circumcision. They failed to understand the freedom that was purchased by Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus, the sinless one. Jesus, the son of the most high God. He paid the debt that you and I will never, ever be able to pray. And that is what changed. That old rugged cross and the empty tomb became for sinners the outward sign and symbol from a debt that could never be repaid. You see, the woman caught in adultery, she was freed from the tyranny of sin and death. Just as the Statue of Liberty represents for so many the yearning for physical freedom of tyranny. Today's scripture begins, for you were called to freedom. Brothers and sisters, only, Only do, do not, not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. That's what Paul is saying. Do, do not, not use it as an opportunity to sin or to do what you want. Say, oh, well, Christ died for me. I can do whatever I want. No, 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 no. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but for love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. You see, Paul knows that laws can be good and helpful, a great advantage in a society such as ours. 
but they are not a good and helpful advantage when they demean, deter, or detain, or denigrate others, or lead them down a wrong path. When, when this happens, happens laws need to change, change, don't they? There are many laws that have had to be changed throughout history. First Peter 2, 16 through 17 says, Live as a people who are free, not to using your freedom as a cover for evil, but as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the kindred, fear God. I love Paul because he not only tells us what not to do, but Paul's a good guy. He also tells us what to do and how to live in a manner that is pleasing to God. You see, the second part of today's text is just that. Paul telling us what not to do and what, how to. But I say walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Do you remember last week? I hope you do. I talked about living and growing in the spirit. I talked about learning to be a brighter light. We Christians are supposed to live a spirit-filled life. And in that, there is freedom. Second Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit is, there is freedom. Paul goes on to explain what the anti-spirit filled life looks like. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It is each of these behaviors that separate us from God and from one another. St. Paul, God bless him, sprinkled out a lot of his letters to the new churches, the teaching that through faith in Jesus Christ and Christ's salvific work on the cross, you and I have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. And the fruit you get leads to sanctification, which leads to eternal life. It is here in Galatians that Paul re-emphasizes the fruits that lead us towards the spirit-filled life and sanctification, which leads to eternal life in the kingdom of God. They will sound familiar, I hope, as I also spoke of those last week as well. Sometimes things are just really worth re re repeating. Have you ever done that with Facebook? You know, you put something on and then you see it again. You think, wow, that was so good. I'm going to send it again. This is so good. I'm sending it again. The spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. We need to remember and lean into this truth. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are freed by the cross and resurrection of the living Christ. While the American Revolution freed us from the tyranny of English monarch's rule, the Statue of Liberty reminds us of what the person and the promise of equality is personal freedom, what it should look like, a beacon of hope, a promise Paul spoke of when he declared there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Yes, we citizens of the United States of America are free. By the, by the grace of God, God and the lives of the millions who not only died to purchase our freedom, but those who continue to serve to maintain it. But it is only in the cross and the empty tomb of Christ that our truest freedom 
is found. Freedom, freedom from, from sin and death. And, and the freedom, freedom to fulfill all, all promises of love. The Statue of Liberty gives us our late freedom view. It is freedom from tyranny of the body. Jesus Christ's empty tomb gives us freedom of from the tyranny of sin and death. What Our Lady Liberty stands for? Well, it's the freedom to feed the hungry, welcome the stranger, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick, to befriend the prisoner, to provide for widows and orphans, and doing all of this in love. I hope your personal takeaway this morning from everything that I've said is this. Responding to the Spirit is exercising your freedom to do what is right. Let me repeat that. Responding to the Spirit is exercising your freedom to do what is right. And may God make it so.